um, learning the line, um, something that I have been doing for a while, uh, and you'll find out why I've been doing it for a while now uh, as I go through the presentation. But I guess um, the first thing we ought to ask ourselves is, uh, if I can work this, oh yes, okay, is why bother doing it? And, and the why bother really comes down to to go faster. I think it's pretty self-evident that's what you want to do. Um, but also, um, it enhances the challenge a bit. So as we were saying, line solving clearly isn't complicated enough, so we have to invent ways of making it more difficult. And uh, learning the line is one of those. So I thought what I'd do is just talk through um, how I got into line following and, and, and the, the, the robots that kind of got me here. Um, and I'll start off by showing you the first one, which was Ferris. And as you can see, that didn't end very well. Um, that, that was built around a, a, a processor board, a project board, which is quite small, had a DS pick on it. Um, and then everything else is very big to make room for everything around it. Use lots of ribbon cables and nasty things. Um, and it never really uh, amounted to very much, I'm afraid. But uh, I guess I learned a few things as I went through that one. Um, the next robot I built was Assy Mouse. That's probably the first robot I properly built. I built a pick one um, from Derek and Jim. And you'll have seen that running in the maze. Um, but Assy Mouse was, um, was the first real robot that I built. And I'm going to talk about that one in a minute because that's actually going to be the demonstration, if you like, of the, of the ideas and thoughts behind uh, learning the line. And then the final robot, well, that's not the final anymore, I, I correct myself. Anyway, the last uh, line funnel that I built was um, Magellan, which is a UK Mars bot. And again, I'll talk a little bit about that and um, show you a couple of videos, although you may already have watched those if you downloaded them from the links that, that I gave you earlier on. So that's kind of how I got to, to where I am. So I'm going to talk first a bit about Assy Mouse. Um, it's uh, a DSPIC 33E base. I don't know, can, can someone shout, can you see my mouse moving on the screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Yeah, just. Uh, so that's the DSPIC 33 there. That's the line following flavor of it. Um, but it was built for the IET competition, if anyone remembers those. Uh, but also the UK Mars event. So it can do full size line following, drag race, uh, wall following in the maze and, and maze solving. So this one on the, the left here is the line following configuration. The only thing, thing that's different is the sensor boards. Uh, and the one on the right is the, is the maze solving flavor. Um, and uh, I think you'll have seen the maze solver running around as well. Um, in some ways, it's very similar to a UK Mars bot because it's worked with a lot of the same constraints. So it uses the same motor encoder pairings, uh, so a classic sort of N20 um, Pololo or Primaroni motors with the Pololo or Primaroni encoders on the back, but the Hall effect encoders. It uses the same motor bridge, um, which you can't see very easily because it's actually standing up on the Assy Mouse board to make room for this whopping great um, processor board. Um, it, the actual size of the robot board is, is pretty much the same because it was driven by what was available to be built on the free version of Eagle um, for, for the PCB. Um, so quite a bit of it's the same. The um, line following board, the standard full-size line following board on uh, UK Mars, but the circuitry is pretty much modeled on what was used on ASI Mouse. So the single central emitter with side um, photo transistor receivers and then the, the index and uh, start finish uh, sensors as well. Um, so that was ASI Mouse. Um, it, it, it's kind of 
drawback to one thing I, 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 sh I was stupid I should have let them push the wheels into the chassis instead of sticking on the outside and having all that extra width um, not so critical on the line following but obviously in the maze that's a bit more of a, a restriction um, but because uh, that board is so big the motors have to be moved back which is why it's asymmetric it's asymmetric um, the wheels are, are quite a long way back so it's quite front heavy uh, and for quite a while I ran it as is, um, the difficulty being that it had put quite a lot of pressure on the nose skid uh, and if you've got bad joints in, in the old boards that we used to use, um, it could come a cropper just by, by driving into them. So in fact, I added extra weight to this to balance it uh, underneath the battery. So no ideal, um, it, it's pretty heavy. Um, Nevertheless, it's been reasonably competitive on the line um, and uh, there's a reason for that and the only real reason that it's competitive as a line for love because it doesn't really stand a chance on pure physics it, um, is because it learns the line and then it replays the line based on that knowledge. Um, so that's the... Um, that, that's kind of the, 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 my, my, my intro into why did I learn the line and has it worked? Yes, it has. Uh, I'm guessing that Asimaus will be retiring from line following as we retire the full size competition um, later this year. And uh, although it's um, done okay actually in drag racing in the past, um, the game's moved on. So Asimaus really can only do a drag race in about. 2.3, I think it's about its best time. And uh, so we've seen Neil and we've seen um, Chris and we've seen Duncan all making sure that the only way you can win now is being less than two seconds. So it's uh, not going to happen with asking us. I'm probably going to kind of retire it anyway. But it uh, will probably serve as quite a useful um, aid to this discussion um, because. Um, what I've just put up here are the data structures that ASIMAUS uses for um, its line learning and line replay. And I will say, because I can't see anybody, I'm afraid I'm on my body's PowerPoint taking my world over in here. If you've got any questions, please just shout out as they go through this. So ASIMAUS is basically written in C. Um, and it has a simple uh, structure for learning the line. Um, I'm just going to get the, which is the structure line manoeuvre. Uh, and we store, I store an array of these. So there's one of, one of these structure elements for, for every manoeuvre and every index point on the, on the line that you see. Um, if you're wondering what this strange thing is, QEI counter, it's, um, it's a strange thing from uh, uh, the on the DS pick. Essentially, it's an unsigned 32-bit integer. Um, they just create a, a slightly more complicated structure, so you can actually break it down into single precision you know, the two 16-bit components, or give it as a 32-bit and do a few other things. Because uh, one of the big benefits of the um, DS pick is that it does have two uh, quadrature encoder channels on it. Um, and if you put the library in, you can just read off, um, well, at the simplest level, you can read off the counters, but it will also do speeds and accelerations if, if that's the stuff you're into. I just use it quite simply, um, but I'm just explaining it because that's a strange type. So for QEI counter, read unsigned long, um, and that's what it has. And I'm storing three values there. Um, distance, which is in counts. This is all in wheel counts. There's nothing fancy or clever about this. Uh, and then what's on the left wheel and what's on the right wheel. Um, and uh, follow that with a turn type, which we'll talk about in a moment. That's the classification of the turn. And a thing I've called inflection index. So, Basically, as the mouse, as the mouse goes around on its explore run, it, it's reading the uh, 
start finish and the radius markers and every time it sees one of those events and says I've got a new maneuver here uh, it will store the previous maneuver away in terms of distance which is derivable right because it, it's just simply left plus right over two uh, but because it's simply just to reference it I store it once rather than calculating it on the fly and then what was the left wheel count and what was the right wheel count so is the is the distance the um, the distance from the end of the last manoeuvre? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's essentially the distance from the last index marker. Right, but the index markers aren't regular. They're 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 like the last, from the last corner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the segment length, effectively. Yeah. yeah. So right. it's literally, it's literally saying I'm going to break this up by every time I see a marker. That tells me either I've got a radius change or it's a start finish. So right. We're just, okay. We're just so talking about the actual physical markers that are on the board. We're talking about distance the from the last yeah. marker from yeah. from the sensors. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Um, so when you go around and explore, actually all I'm collecting at that point is the is the distance, the left wheel and the right wheel. That's that stuff that's clearly readily available. You go over the marker, uh, you make sure it's not a crossover, and then you say, okay, what was how, how far have I gone since the last last marker? I'll store that away because that's a maneuver I'd like to try and repeat. Um, at the end of the explore run, you can then take your time and post-process, if you like, through this array of maneuvers. And the first thing you can do is uh, figure out what kind of turn type it is. And turn types really are, um, on, on a full-size line, I've got them set up, obviously, zero is a straight, but then the three different radius curves you can have. Um, it's actually not that critical, but it's quite useful to have several of these. You could have more if you wanted to. Can I make a sh quick point? Yeah. Um, those um, unit size radii applied when we had the big tires. The only yep. constraint on the current line following courses is the minimum radius. Yeah. And we can yep. use any random radius we want apart from that. Absolutely right. Um, and I think as we go on, you'll you'll see why I'm not so worried about it. Um, because basically, you're going to use this to try and control how fast you go. Um, and it's really a range of radii that you're looking at. So it's a little bit simplistic, but you have to remember this is how I, this is when I set the data structure up when the world was young and relatively tax free and, and, I, and I thought life was going to be simple. Um, but it's fine. And you could have as many as you like. Uh, and I'll explain that in a moment. But basically, Think of turn types as just an ascending list of increasingly tight corners to get around, um, starting with a straight, which is obviously the easiest. And um, you need to know whether you're going left or right, so you need a turn sign in there as well. So obviously you need to know whether you're going clockwise or anti-clockwise. And then the final thing I calculated in there was uh, what I've called the inflection index. And that's done by processing through a second pass through the maneuvers. And what it's trying to get at is just how difficult is the is the next radius marker change going to be for me. So if I'm going from straight to a 45 left or right, it's a relatively minor adjustment for me. When I'm going from a, a left 15 centimeter radius turn to a right 15 centimeter radius turn, then that's a bit tougher and a bit stiffer, so I'm probably going to want to change my speed. So the way I've calculated the inflection index is by this um, calculation I kind of pulled out on the right-hand side here. It's an absolute value to tell you um, if you're trying to get at something that's telling you how difficult it's going to be, uh, and you just take um, the signed turns um, away from each other, um, so that if you go from a uh, radius left three to a radius right three, you're going to end up with 
uh, an infection in that's a six coming down all the way i'll pause in case anybody wants to challenge me on that but that's pretty much what it does um, there's no reason at all why that whole method can't be extended to um, 7.5 which is the current minimum on a half size um, robot uh, and obviously as Duncan said we're not limited now to fixed radii um, but you probably want to cluster them or group them in some way okay uh, is everybody comfortable I'll go on so as simple as that really you go around you map it out you know exactly what you want to do so you can just pick up those maneuvers and, and replay them and what could possibly go wrong uh, well the biggest thing for me that goes wrong is wheel slip um, so you've got all these lovely counts stored away you've probably got some wheel slip in the count that you've taken when you were doing explore although because it's an explorer you can actually go relatively slowly and, and limit your, your wheel slip but as you go quicker um, uh, I, I inevitably get wheel slip and I've tried all sorts of um, things around wheel slip and I'll talk a little bit about the mitigations that I've done but uh, many of the things I've tried haven't really worked very well um, that's probably the biggest single thing to worry about uh, variations between runs I mean you're following a line there's no um, there's no guarantee that you're going to follow exactly the same course around a line track every time you run it so you are going to get variations on these uh, on these counts um, between the left and the right wheel just even when you're running maybe at the same speed on the same line things are just going to be slightly different as they come along and then the other problem that can occur and, 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 and it's pretty horrible if it does is missing markers and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well um, it matters um, it actually matters whether you're exploring or running fast uh, it tends to happen more when you're running fast uh, but they're, they're the main issues um, that are going on so if you miss a marker on the explore um, as I have been known to do then for example you might have a tight turn on the end of a straight but if you miss a, one of the markers somewhere uh, you might actually or you miss a marker going onto a straight from a tight turn which is probably more likely you're going to average I'm going to average across the whole maneuver because I see it as one I'm going to see the whole maneuver probably as pretty close to a straight if it's got any length on it it'll average out the, uh, um, the, the, the wheel count differences between the left and the right so I'm going to try and go probably way too fast for the, for the twisty bit so missing markers pain in the neck and uh, the bottom line really is you can't afford to miss them you can't afford to miss the marker so um, that's kind of what I learned with ASML so here's the, the robot again I'm sorry the photo is okay I think but um, you can see it here so what mitigations does uh, does ASML have on it around these these particular problems now you can laugh but the first time I tried to do a replay I just thought well I know I know what the line looks like I've got a whole series of maneuvers here I'll just play out those maneuvers and I didn't even look at the markers on the fast run um, and for all the reasons I was just talking about there about wheel slip and uh, uh, variations you end up spinning off somewhere because you're not where you think you are on the line uh, and uh, everything goes a bit pear-shaped sooner or later um, it's probably a little bit uh, misleading for me because on a short home track there was enough um, accuracy that you didn't notice that missing them up not doing anything about repositioning yourself or recalibrating your position 
was a problem. But, but as soon as you get onto a longer track with a few more turns on it, um, then you will come a cropper on that. So you have to recalibrate, um, which means that you have to um, uh, read the markers on the on the replay as well as on the on the explore and then the marker will actually reset your position um so you've got it's a, it's like being in the maze you're looking at wall edges you're looking for any clues you can get to say where do i think i am where am i really um and then those markers are absolutely crucial for it so wheel slipper variations significantly uh, mitigated by making sure you read the markers as you go around on your replay. Um, now, there's that funny thing, you know, might not have seen it sticking out of the front of, of, of Assy Mouse there. Um, because, as you remember, this is a very heavy robot um, and also suffering from wheel slip. So when it's going down the straight um, at some speed, and it can go at a reasonable speed down the straight, um, stopping can be challenging and if you rely just on counters to determine your slowing down and braking point then um, you're basically going to be quite slow and, uh, and, and some of you might have seen this in the past with what some of my runs before this was on here um, wheel slip says I think I'm much further down the straight than I, I really am so I'd better start slowing down so you make this really impressive acceleration, get up to your whatever speed you think you should be going at, and then you're all oh, nearly at the end now, I'll, I'll start my deceleration. And, <clears throat> and then the marker never appears because you're not there. So your default speed drifts you along to the marker. Finally, you see the marker and everything takes off again. Uh, so most of the advantage that you might have had is, is pretty well um, taken away from you. Excuse me just a second. So it turns out on Assy Mouse, I actually had some spare sensors. I had originally put on Assy Mouse um, a central line emitter and uh, a left and right of the line detector, which you'll all be familiar with from, from, from the UK Mars bot setup. But I also had some extreme left and right detectors, no emitters, just extra detectors on the outer edge with the thought that I might be able to pick up um, some kind of signal from the line uh, even further away. And um, that turned out to be rubbish, basically. That didn't work. So I had two, two um, spare sensors already um, wired up. Uh, all the circuitry in. So I took the um, the wider left sensor and put it out where that big red arrow is sticking. Um, so that's a little sensor pair there. You can probably just see there's a, there's a photo transistor and, a, and an LED out there as an early detector for radius markers used on the straight. So now as my robot's going down the straight, it can actually detect um the upcoming radius marker sometime before it reaches it and gives it a lot more chance to decelerate to a speed where it might get around the curve uh, than if that wasn't there at all at all um <clears throat> i won't go into much more than that there's a few more complications on that if you think about it uh, you'll realize there's a few things you have to account for um when you're hammering down the straight and what that sensor might be seeing. Um, but they're, they're quite doable and that actually works. So Assy Mouse is able to know it's coming to the end of the straight, when it's coming to the end of the straight and do something about deceleration. Missing markers. Um, <laughs> well, I'm going to sort of bask in this for a moment was Right from the from the start, I built Assy Mouse with the um, start finish and the radius detectors right back by the axle line, really, of the two motors. So quite as close, really, to the pivot point um, of the robot as I could get. Um, and that turns out that's the right thing to do. Um, it works well. 
uh, Latin mouse uh, doesn't miss markers. Um, uh, and uh, that problem, I guess I didn't have to deal with on that robot. We'll, we'll talk about the next one in a moment. Uh, so that was pretty. That's pretty much my learning curve through the Rassy Mouse. Um, and if you're new and thinking about things, the thing I should have learned was that the DS Pic 33, which is a lovely microcontroller, is way too complicated if that's what you're starting out with. It cost me probably quite a lot of time just getting my head around how to use a DS Pic 33 and make it even talk to me. Um, so it does a lot of stuff very well, very cleverly, but um, it's probably way too complex for a, for a first uh, first entry. Uh, well, it was for me anyway. It, it cost me quite a lot of time. But having done it, um, it does work pretty well. But as I say, it's very big, that board. It's a 100-pin package. Um, and uh, it compromises the physics of the robot quite a lot. Uh, before I click on, has anybody got any questions on ASCII mouse? I'm going to move on to Magellan in a second. No? Okay. So Magellan. Um, this is a UK Mars bot. And uh, I actually caught it, just ported my code essentially across from ASCII mouse into the um, into the uh, Arduino environment here, uh, which demonstrates the point that you don't really need the DSP. You can you can run pretty much the same code uh, on an Arduino, um, and uh, no real issues. It's it's written in C, so the uh, the Arduino sketch or ES code as I use now is all fine and dandy with it. Um, I took the um, standard board and I took and modified it for full size and half size sensors. So the robot can actually run on a full size line or on a half size line. Um, and it, you can do that just by selecting that by putting it over a marker uh, on initialization. And if you're over a marker for a half size, pressing the button and it will flip, flip itself into using the half size sensors. Otherwise, they use the full size sensor. Um, there are two slight differences here. The picture at the top is an earlier picture of my dual scale um, robot, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And for the bottom one here, that's slightly bigger, is actually what I'm running at the moment. Very similar, but there are a few differences. And uh, the key difference um, was to move the half size. Uh, marker sensors back towards the axle of the robot. Um, so I'll talk about that in a bit, but they're actually on this piece of error board here. Um, the cabling is literally taken off the end of the line sensor basic board back to here. But I've also kept the full size ones as well. Um, so the robot still runs uh, both gauges. Um, and the full size sensors are moved out. Um, because the standard dark line follow board will work. You have to point the sensors out to see the markers on full size. Better to put the wings on so you're actually going over them. Um, and there's just a slight complication, which I'll explain now, which is um, this top robot, uh, my first dual gauge, actually fell foul of the fact that when you do half size, the robot has half size limitations on it. And these wings made it just a bit wider than the uh, proper size for a half size line follower. So the new one, which is moved the um, sensors back for both half size and full size, has also constrained the size of the wings. So this will now uh, satisfy all the requirements for a, for a half size line follower. So it's just, you know it, we're discontinuing full size, so we, we don't need to worry about it. I won't, well, I won't go on about it. Um, it's suboptimal for full size, but it's okay for half size. So um, the main board I, to do this, the main board was hacked, and, and I'm showing the picture there because I mean literally hacked. 
um, to allow me to get those uh, half size uh, marker sensors in, inboard, and back towards uh, the pivot point of the robot. And on this picture, you can pretty well clearly see everything actually. So you can see these are the half size, these are the half size sensor here and over here. And then the full size ones are out here on these wings. And then the line is just the same as normal with the single emitter and the, the two sensors on either side. Um, so when Peter was calling for suggestions for changes to the board, which resulted in 1.3, um, he has incorporated uh, a request for us to put holes in the board somewhere around here. Um, so you can point the sensors down. And I know I was telling, chatting to Chris just before this, Chris is actually making use of those. So he didn't have to get his drill and, and saw out to, to, to do this job that I did. Um, if you want to do this, you do have to be careful. There is a, I can't remember, there's a five volt line uh, track somewhere pretty close around here. So you do have to be pretty careful about how far in you go. Um, Magellan is, is, is lighter than us and us, so it's, um, so it's quicker, uh, naturally quicker. Um, and uh, it's reasonably competitive. Um, surprisingly reasonably competitive as a half size um, robot. Um, and again, it's only reasonably competitive as a half size because it learns the line. So Bernard's, I can't remember the name of your robot, Bernard, your small line follower, your purpose-built half-size line follower is quicker than this. Uh, beat me in autumn, although um, due to the vagaries of the competition and things that go wrong, Magellan did better in the summer. Um, so it's quite possible to make, the, make this go close, but not as fast as, um, as the purpose-built small half-size line follower. Uh, I think there was, better, there was a, I think there was a second between us in in, in, in October, which is a lot, um, and maybe there's more work to be done. Um, so that's Magellan. Um, so what I was going to do now, and I will do, um, is to play the video of Magellan exploring. Um, if you've downloaded the ones I sent you, that's great. Um, play it now by all means. I'll play it on the video and if it plays okay, good. If it doesn't, please download the ones I, I sent you links to and you'll be able to see it um, working properly. Um, and I'm hoping I can get off this slide in a minute, but we'll see. Okay, how did that play? It was fine. Okay. Yeah, that played all right. Yeah, it's at a slightly lower frame rate than it should have, but perfectly viewable. Okay, good. Uh, well, if you want to see it in all its glory, it's, uh, it's, it's downloadable. I apologize for it being cut off in the corners. That's due to a rookie error. I set my camera up on a tripod forgetting that my video aspect ratio was different to the photo aspect ratio. Um, so it letterboxed it for me and chopped the sides of the track off towards the bottom there. All right, so I thought I'd show you this because this is what um, Magellan spits out at the end of its run. Uh, and you'll see it's not particularly pretty because it's normally, I normally pick these um, messages that are sent out over Bluetooth. Um, and, and stick them in a spreadsheet to, to split them out with CSV or whatever. Um, so I'll just talk you through what's on the screen here. So obviously on the left-hand side here is a date time stamp. Uh, that's actually provided by the software that's uh, receiving the Bluetooth message. So um, that's all fairly boring because it's all, all in the same second uh, because it's the end of the run um, and it's dumping out the maneuvers. Um, the next bit is actually what kind of message is coming out over the Bluetooth. But, uh, this is a, these are maneuver messages, so they're telling me that these are maneuvers. 
um, uh, they could be debug messages and they could be, uh, there are other types of messages in there in events. But so the next thing just tells you it's a maneuver. So for every message that I output, I actually output the tick count um, from the timer. Uh, so I know when the message was, was issued. Um, and on the Arduino, I've certainly had to uh, buffer things because the Arduino didn't seem to be capable of splitting stuff out reliably over Bluetooth at the same time as controlling the robot. Um, so you have to kind of limit the traffic a bit. But anyway, so you get a you get a tick count. You can see um, for other events, it's much more interesting. You don't really need it for maneuvers. Um, and then in a maneuver message, you're going to get the following things. You're going to get the maneuver number. Um, what's the left count? What's the right count? What's the straight? Whether it's a straight or not, and whether there's a breaking distance. Um, and this kind of demonstrates the, the, the kind of victory, victory of reality over hope, I suspect. Um, so ignore the first one. It's because it's a header record. It's just it's, it's not relevant. So the first real maneuver, maneuver number one here, um, had a left count of 145 and a right count of 172. Um, it's got a zero in the straight field because it's saying it's not a straight. Uh, I post-processed it and decided that this is not a straight. So what I found in um, uh, Asimaus, I've also found in Magellan, and I haven't found the answer to this yet, is uh, it's pretty easy to use information about straights. It's much harder to overlay um, a known curvature with error corrections coming from the line as well. So in fact, simplistically, all Magellan does is look for straights and then looks to perform well on straights. Um, so ideally, going back to the Asimov data structure I showed you early on, that really should be the turn type. Um, so we can do more with it. And obviously, it could be the turn type. Uh, right now, uh, it's just constraining itself to straight. And breaking distance, uh, again, is to do with that um, inflection index that I was talking about. And again, on Magellan, I've not successfully implemented that yet. So um, Magellan has uh, an idea that it will go at a certain speed around uh, its corners and it will go at other speeds when it's on the straight. So breaking distance is actually not needed for each specific maneuver because you know when you're coming off a straight, you're going to want to slow down to what you think is a safe cornering speed. Um, so just running down here, maneuver two is got uh, left of 51, right of 165, that's definitely not a straight. Uh, but the next one here is quite interesting because it's 1502 and 1516. They're not the same number. Um, and trust me, they probably never will be. Um, but they're close enough. So they're within my tolerances for me to say that's a straight. Um, and it's quite surprising. Um, Here's one here that's been classified as a straight. So maneuver five is classified as a straight, where you've got 258 and 302. Quite a big difference. Um, but I still think that's a straight. And behind that is the fact that when you go onto a straight, you're coming off a curve and you're going onto a curve. Um, and it's about when you see markers. But you're always going to have an element of some steering going on. Um, actually, included in the real counts of what you're seeing as a straight because, um, excuse me, I'm going to struggle because somebody wants to join and I don't even know how I'm going to see that. Just give me a second, guys.
All right. Okay. I, I hope that's... <clears throat> um, right, I think I've managed to navigate that. Um, so what I was saying there is that when you look at us, um, you're going onto a straight, we'll have some element of steering coming off the corner that you, you, you're coming out of, probably. And you may have some element of the, of the turning of the robot as it's heading into the, the corner, because remember, you're watching, you're looking, looking at those markers along the pivot point of the robot. So it's quite unlikely that a straight will ever have beautifully symmetric values between the left and the right. And then the shorter the straight is, the more the differences are going to become evident. So I'm trying to know which one we're looking at. We're looking at um, this one here. So you've got 348, 375, two different wheel counts, but actually that's probably a straight. Um, do do you have a, a fixed percentage? Because, I mean, that's about 17% difference, which is, you know, quite a lot off. I mean, are you sort of saying, well, anything less than 20% is a straight or is a, a fixed much. amount? Yeah, look at the proportion between the two the two wheel counters. And then, um, and I can't remember, David, I may even take account of how long the straight is because percentage isn't great. So in, in this one up here, you know, where, where it's 1,500 wheel counts, <clears throat> 17% on that would be a, quite a lot, right? <laughs> to have as a difference and still call it a straight. Um, so I, I can't remember. I have a feeling that I actually do take account of just how long the total uh, maneuver is uh, before applying the percentage. Because um, you can so, expect, yeah. So do, do the rules uh, have a, a minimum angle or, or could you have a, you know, one degree difference along from one end to the other that's actually a curve but looks a bit like a straight. Oh, you can, well, as, as Duncan has said, we can have any radius we like now. So right. As long as we don't go sh smaller than 7.5 centimetres. Right. Like so, so, so assuming that two um, being quite fairly close, you've, you've got to be very careful in, in what you pick. The, the yeah, you you have to you have to do some work really, uh, and um, I was surprised at, at how much tolerance I had to build in. Um, now go too far, and you're going to classify things as straight that aren't straight, and you might have some problems. The um, question was about the um, not just the radius, but the angle uh, subtended by the curve. Right, so you might have a large radius or even small radius and like a three degrees of, of turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you wouldn't get much difference. Um, and there is no, no, the answer to the, the original question is no, it, it could just be a two degree turn. It would be a bit of a mean thing to do, but it could be. Uh, yeah, well, I've got a home track here, which I, I printed out deliberately with some little squiggles in it. Um, so small, you know, Turns of quite not very many degrees, followed by turns of not very many degrees in the other direction. Um, See, there is a minimum length of turn. It has to be, I think, seventy-five millimeters. I think that's right. Along the line. Yeah. I think that's right, and that, but I think my home track's illegal deliberately, as in it's even shorter than that. Um, and if you can handle that, you should be able to handle the real line. Um, so. It, it 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 was a nice brave new world, but actually, I've it's turned out that, as usual, um, you need to do things pretty simple. And I may be uh, jumping ahead of it here. So, okay. So presumably, some of this was worked out when we had the tiles, where you would you couldn't get that sort of thing. Which you always had three or four yeah. different types of turn, and then yeah. it's fixed. Yeah, but, I mean, when you were doing that. I don't. Think, it hasn't actually made a lot of difference, if I'm honest. Mm. Right? Um, it, 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 it's easy. To, I guess it's easy to understand, but it, it's, mm. it doesn't actually make a lot of difference to the robot. Yeah, but um, as you say, this all of this is really to estimate how fast you can go along a specific straight. In the end, you're going to be looking for the marker to actually 
decide where the where the end is. I'll come. I'll come to that in a minute. Yeah, <laughs> I'll come to that in a minute. So this is Magellan. So this is the UK Mars block with the ASIMAUS code essentially ported into it to run in the Arduino environment, and it dumps its stuff out like this at the end of uh, at the end of its explore, um, and it also tells you conveniently at the bottom there what the runtime was um, in two millisecond um, units. So you have to double that to get the number of milliseconds it actually took to do the run. Um, just to save me run, putting a timer out as well. So that's Magellan. Um, uh, just so we can uh, make the point, this is Magellan replaying, and you'll see basically it accelerating there down the straight. Um, not much different there, and then accelerating again. Um, and that was the uh, replay run from Magellan. Uh, and that's just optimizing on straights. Uh, so I'll just kind of go in. So just so you can see there, um, and that's the 2022 half-size line follower track. Um, say 1.8 seconds between the explore and the replay. Um, so it was 14% quicker. Uh, you might go quicker than that still, but that's still 14% uh, is worth having. 1.8 seconds is the difference between the first or second or third place, I would think. Um, so we were just straight into this area. Keep it simple, stupid was my kind of guidance here. I'm currently only using the straights, and that's, that's the only enhancement that's going on. Um, but it still yields that kind of result. Okay, so that means you're doing all the corners at the same speed? Yeah. Yeah. It does. I have tried all sorts of things, Derek, um, to be clever, um, and found a very unpredictable results, let's put it that way. Um, yeah, it was all good. <laughs> but there is a challenge in here, which is this point here, really. There's, there's something to be had here. There's loads more to be got from this kind of technique because you can figure out how to combine, combine the defined terms with an error adjustment from your position on the line. Um, you should be able to get more back. So um, I, I, as an aside, on one of the runs, and I can't remember which year it was, there was a... Um, there was quite a large 45-ish centimetre radius turn. And it just so happened that that fitted within my criteria on that day as being cut classed as a straight. Um, and it was very impressive because actually the robot can go around a 45 centimetre curve at the speed I was trying to go around the straight. Um, so it just accelerated its way around. Um, <clears throat> so... I haven't cracked yet how to get a steering adjustment to work properly. I have got a, um, a code set for, uh, stolen really from um, from yours, Peter, the um, the early UK Mars book code. So using using a profiler, um, using the uh, motor controller, um, and I haven't managed to figure out how to get the steering to work to make it better. So in fact, that code set at the moment uh, is slower than the code that was ported out of um, SMLs. But I think there's, there's mileage there. I, I leave it to uh, others to, to um, show me up for being not very clever. Um, so that's that. Um, that's there. Uh, now Magellan doesn't have early market detection whereas Asimaus did, uh, and I think that would be, um, if you're going to concentrate on straight, then that would be uh, a pretty good thing to do, and not difficult to do. Um, it worked really well on, on, on Asimaus. So I've tried all sorts of things around compensating for wheel slip, uh, including looking in the, um, the encoder, processing to say, what my robot's telling me it's just done, it can't possibly do, the wheels can't go that fast. Um, that's fine, but then what do you do about it? 
Um, and I, I, that hasn't really worked well. But what has worked well on SMLs and may well work well on other robots is to add that early marker detection for going down straights and rely on that to tell you when you're reaching the end of the straight rather than having to um, calculate it. So what you saw there with Magellan running is Magellan adjusting itself as best it can for what it thinks is going on. Um, so, the, so it's not going as fast as it could because it, it's, it's got to be conservative about the fact that the, it, it doesn't really know exactly where down the street it is. Um, and if anyone can tell me how to improve traction and reduce wheel slip, um, please come in now. Uh, yeah. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. Because because okay. the, um, the bottom line is, if you can reduce wheel slip, a lot of the issues that you're dealing with um, will then go away, but they certainly become a, a lot less. Yeah, one of the one of the issues I had at Hazelmere was that because I put some learning in in mine, and uh, what I've found is when it if I, if it didn't quite slow down enough on the corners, it used to lose um, lose the the line to follow, and then used to spin up and, and span off. Yeah. So traction was I think traction was a big issue for me. Yeah. yeah. So the. Um yeah, if you call it lost motion, if you're accelerating a straight line uh, and you tell your robot to um, put the hammer down and do five meters in a straight line, okay, the harder you accelerate, the, the more you will fall short. And that yeah. should be a, a common observation from, from all of you who've tried it uh, and would be embarrassing on the drag race. The um, Once you get beyond a certain... Uh, level of acceleration, the amount of lost motion is linearly proportional to the acceleration. Strictly speaking, it's proportional to acceleration at all accelerations. But, uh, and I happen to have tested this um, just last week, below a certain amount, you know, one meter per second or whatever, you, you just don't notice it. But as soon as you start to get up to like three, four, five, um, and more, you will experience loss motion, and it's pretty much linearly proportional. So, one thing that people do is they um, set their robot down, do some uh, known acceleration runs, measure the shortfall, build a table, and then look up what they expect to lose for that amount, that distance, and that combination of acceleration. So that's one thing. Um, and another thing, um, that's what the that's what the smarter people do. <laughs> what I do yeah. is I just put up with the fact that I'm going to fall short um, in the expectation that I always fall short. I never overrun. And so the last section of the uh, of the run, this is in the mouse, obviously, not in the on a line. The last section is done slower than I could possibly do it at. So I come down, coast along, find the marker, then I know I'm turning, right? But I always know I'll fall short, so it's always safe. So long as, and that's the other thing, so long as you see that marker. If you don't see the marker, all bets are off. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what, uh, before the early detection by SMLs, that's what SMLs used to do. So then I would watch SMLs do this really impressive acceleration down the straight. And then I watch it slow itself down to the safe speed and meander up to the marker and then, and then go around the corner safely. It was, it, it didn't spin off. It just lost a lot of its advantage by, by slowing early. And, uh, I'll have a look at that proportional. Cause if, I mean, obviously, if it's proportional, you can create some empirical data and then you can look that up as you're going along. That would, that would probably work okay. I've seen several mice do that, so it's it's probably it's on my list of things to do one day when I stop faffing around with other stuff. <laughs> uh, the the same thing applies um, when you're going round the turn. The um, the slip sideways is directly proportional to accelerate to centripetal acceleration. Yeah. You can compensate for that uh, one day as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
on, on the straight, um, you would have thought that if you're braking at the same rate that you accelerate, then you would extend it and the, the, the whole thing would end up roughly correct. It doesn't, though. Yeah. It's <laughs> not my experience, Derek, I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's a good point, right? You would imagine, and for years, I thought it would be symmetrical, but it turns out no. it's yeah. just not. I don't really understand why. I looked up all kinds of stuff about slip grip, and it leaves me cold. So that's it's the observation that, that wins in the end. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thanks for that. Well, I'm into questions anyway, so... Um, uh, any questions? Far away. Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Um, what's the sort of trade-off between um, having the side markers seen at the front as opposed to back near the wheels? Um, I, I don't think there's any question you need them back near the wheels. You just basically miss them at the front. Mm -hmm. Is it is it because the front is far more likely to be swinging all over the place, where, yeah. whereas the, the wheels are hopefully right above the line in the crib? Well, that's, that's you're pivoting on the wheels all the time. So uh, as you're going around corners, and, um, um, we've seen it several times. I mean, I, I mean, if you rewind a bit, David, to watching it going around the floor at um, BCU. Uh, we put the uh, my one toggles an LED every time it sees a marker because we were desperately looking for the what's it not seeing. Yeah. And then suddenly you see the LED doesn't blink because you've gone either on the in, usually gone on the inside of the marker. Uh, for a given angle of turn, with a sensor a side marker sensor further forward, it's got more lateral motion and yeah. more chance of missing the marker. And they're quite I did on the half size as well. The markers are I quite small. I don't know if I did it uh, to everybody. Um, Ian's seen it, I know. But a while ago, I did a little study yeah, on, yeah, on where I, your sensors have to be. Did I pass that to everybody or not? No. Yeah, so, I saw it. Well, the, the long and short of it is, if you have your robot um, and you know the distance from the centre of the line to the marker, Okay, uh, and you take your worst case minimum radius turn, 75 millimeters or whatever it is. And if you, um, I can't do this with my hands. This is for something else. But if the marker is there, right, and your robot's going along this way, if you draw a circle, um, with the radius of 75 millimetres from up here, and so that the circle kind of does that. Does that make sense to people? That's the path of uh, detection for the, uh, uh, for the line marker. Um, and you, you can get that by... Oh, no, I'm not going to do it all now. I might, yeah. I might maybe do a, a minus thing. Um, but anyway, the, the long and short of it is that you can work out all of the places, all of the worst places that a marker can be as the robot goes by. Uh, and you work it out for the worst case and you get this, this curve. Uh, a, a expecta curve of expectations, a bit like a bracelet of protection. Curve of expectation, right, <laughs> where you might start, where you might see the marker, um, and that is is what is intersected by these holes here. Yeah. Right. So I pretty much guarantee that if you place a marker sensor here on this chassis or in this relationship to the to the wheels, you will see the marker. Which is, um, yeah, and the precursor of that was the hole that I drilled in my board because it's I mean, one point three, and it does work. You don't, you don't lose markers. You just so, Ian, do yeah. you concatenate straights or things that you think are straight? I don't. I don't do that clever bit yet, Duncan. Uh, so, yeah, the, the bit that says. Oh, I'm going left, then I'm going right, then I'm going left, and they're not very long. I'll just go over them. Um, 
so, as a course designer, I can mm. really mess you up with a long list of 75 millimeter sections which don't bend very much. Give you a whole load of markers. Yeah, you could do that if you felt like it, Duncan. <laughs> so if the course looks like that in the summer, Ian, you know it's, it's personal. Uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it, Duncan. I figured it out. <laughs> but, uh, if you look, look at some of the um, Taiwanese and, and Japanese line follower courses, and they have some really horrible, like a huge big radius turn made up of lots of little turns. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Do, are all the turns a constant constant ang um constant turn? You can't constant have radius. a, a yeah. your constant radius. You can't have a turn that, that tightens up as it goes round or anything. Not without putting markers down. Basically the rules right. are that if the radius the markers give it. you the change of um radius. Radius, right, yeah. yeah. Ian, a uh, question for you about uh, crossovers. Do you do anything special about crossovers? Yeah. Oh, sorry, one more. <laughs> what, um, what did you do special about crossovers, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the basic handling of crossovers, um, let's just rewind slightly. So uh, the way I handle crossovers without any just generally is um, when I'm looking at markers, if I see the start of either a start finish marker or a radius marker, I don't do anything until I see the trailing edge of that marker. And then if in the interim, rather while well, the leading edge has come up of let's say the radius marker, if I then see the leading edge of the start finish marker as well, I say, okay, that's crossover. I'm just going to ignore that. Um, but if you get a leading edge followed by a training edge on a marker before anything happens on the other side, then I say, okay, that's a marker. Does that make sense? Sure. So that's how I do crossovers in general. Um, it's you remember when I was talking about the leading um, marker detector on ASIMELS that, that runs down the straights and has an early detect on the marker? You also have to do something clever with that as you're going down a straight um, because it's going to see crossovers as well. It may see other things. So I actually count the detection triggers on the leading detector uh, when I'm doing the explore between the uh, known good markers picked up by the radius detectors, if that makes sense. So I start a maneuver by seeing the marker on the on the uh, radius detector back by the wheel. And once I've started that maneuver, any time I see a trigger on the leading edge detector, I count it until I find the next radius marker with the radius detector. So that tells me when I go down this straight, you're going to see two, three, four, five pulses on that sensor. But it's the last one that you're interested in. Yeah. Okay. I don't have anything clever than that. That's it, really. Um, Do you do anything clever on um, the actual block, what, uh, the line follower itself? Because I've, I, I mean, on mine, I, I tends to twitch when it sees because it does, never hits the crossover exactly ninety degrees. So I do tend to find I get, I get a, quite a twitch on that, which could potentially cause problems at speed, I suppose. Which um, are you using the standard board or are you using something different? I've used in a well. I've I've done a bit like you did. I've hacked the um, UK Mars bot to bring the sensors a bit nearer. But that's apart from that. It's, it's the standard UK Mars bot. So on the line, I haven't. I, I I don't know whether it's luck. So this design of having a single emitter in the centre and then a, a detector on either side, which um, I know quite a few people think is way too simplistic. Um, uh, I haven't think it's, it's fine, but that's because that's 
what I did, right? But because the beauty of it is you don't need to calibrate it. Um, as long as you're balancing your light off the line and you know what, you know, you've accounted for any component differences on the left and the right hand side, if you get reduced reflectivity off the line, then both sensors on both sides are going to go down. And if you get increased reflectivity, both sensors go up. So you don't have to do this dancing around on the line at the beginning of the, of the, of the course. You just put it on there. And the two, mine, mine basically just looks for um, the right percentage split accounting for any hardware differences. So it turns out that I think on the current Magellan sensors, it's 50%. So if you've got, you're on the center of the line, both my um, photo transistors will see the same amount. Um, and maybe, I, and maybe that is a change because I've changed it to have two emitters. Yeah, well, I think that, and I, and I have found that really stable. Mm. Um, so you you know so you're relying on the single light source it's either hitting the line or it's not hitting the line uh, and and if you're to one side of it one one of your side sensors is going to get it and the other one isn't um it's pretty much it um and i don't get twitches at crossovers on that probably because the, as you go over crossover for sure the reflectivity goes up right it's going to now, if you've got a single emitter, it's going to be on the same point for both detectors. They're going to see the same thing, even if you're at an angle. But if you've got two emitters and you're at an angle, they're going to be bouncing off different points on the on the on the surface. So yeah, I guess sure. that gets back to the other twitch. Yeah, yeah. At school, we just got the standard single emitter. And to keep things really simple, all we do is we just take the difference between the two front sensors, multiply that or divide it by factor and, and modify the speeds right and left by, by whatever that number is. Uh, and that works remarkably well and uh, uh, a very simple bit of code. Um, I think the thing that Neil was talking about, though, is when you come to a crossover and angle, and certainly I found on the... Um, little small test track um, which has got a really tight loop at the end um, I noticed um, I was having trouble with the uh, the technique of um, one side spotting the beginning of the line and then seeing if you see the other side by the time you get to the end um, I was actually on a crossover because of the angle as you were coming around and not mm. being um, straight on and partly also because the sensors were towards the front um, I was actually seeing and losing one side just before I actually saw the other side of the crossover um, yeah. uh, and that meant I was I was completely failing to see it that, as a crossover I think that's a real indication of why you need to move the sensors back Yeah. Right? because what, what, you know, the great thing about crossovers is there are rules about it. You, you have to have a certain amount of straight in front of one and a certain amount of straight behind it. Yeah. So you should be going over a crossover pretty well orthogonal to the crossing line. Um, and if you're, if, you're, but if you're coming off a curve into, into that, you're, you've got all that stuff that we just talked about. Mm. Um, Whereas if you've got your sensors back close to the pivoting point, by the time you reach the crossover and detect one side or the other, you should be pretty straight. Yeah, it may be partly a question of the, the small test track um, because the crossover is basically where it loops around and it crosses over itself in a circle. Um, there really isn't much straight there at all um, before okay. well, the crossover. Uh, okay, yeah. The, the, um, way, the way is how could probably be described, David. Yeah. Um, we've had it over the years. Um, and we used to try this edge detection method, and it didn't really work for us, same as you're experiencing. And one of the warriors, a girl called Lahari, uh, we, we now use what we call the Lahari method. Instead of going for edges, we detect the starting edge, and we keep polling, looking for the other side until we've gone a distance. Hmm? And if you set that distance to whatever it needs to be, 30 millimetres or something, you're guaranteed to find the other side if it's there. 
Yeah, we're, we were just looking at something like that at school because at the moment we've just got to the stage where we're trying to A, detect the end marker and stop and also just starting to um, avoid crossovers or we're at that stage with, with this year's lads of just trying to do that. And, and again, that was one of the suggestions that we actually um, did a, a half a second or something after we'd spotted one side before we stopped looking for the other side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a, a quick uh, observation or thought from someone who's never done any of this. Um, it, it would seem to me that if you, because you've got a left and a right um, sensor uh, for the for the tags on the side, yeah. yeah. Um, one one of them is for um, detecting the finish, and the other one is for detecting a corner. If you put those so that they weren't at the same point, one further forward than the other, then you could detect a um, you could detect a, a crossover like that. Because if you get if you get um, the one coming through on the other side, then it's not the it's not the finish, um, and and therefore you'd know that it was a that it was a crossover, and it would, it would be a possible. You'd always treat it as a possible crossover. Until you saw the what the the finish one on the other side, that does that help? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's I, it, yeah. I have to think about that. <laughs> yeah, have I yeah. have I stopped paying attention, or, or which is most likely, yeah. um, or <laughs> have we conflated two things? Did we not start off by worrying about maintaining good steering? Um, as you pass over a crossover and yeah. turn that into distinguishing between crossovers and markers. Well, if if you uh, detect if you detect the uh, the the what you don't know is is whether it's a crossover. So if the marker detector can detect the the um, the, the the line first, you can then ignore the, the steering for a bit. I, yeah, but yeah. that's but, but that's just, I've just that's so, the problem with that is that we've already said that we want to put the marker detectors further back than the uh, than yeah. the things. Yeah. Um, well, don't just so separate help. the two things for a moment. The, the yeah. steering as you as you pass a crossover could be caused by any number of things, and even um, even if you think you're travelling straight, how sure are you that the, your two um, steering sensors are not, you know, slightly skewed in any case, right? How precise does that have to be? So I would, I would suggest that if you're seeing a twitch as you go over a crossover, your steering is wound up too tight, uh, and you might consider putting a little low pass filter in it, or turning down again, or or doing something else, right? If it if it sees that tiny change, even because it's skewed or whatever. And that causes you to switch. I would suggest that your the steering controller is a bit tight. Well, I think where I was seeing it was more that you've just come round a bend, and there, then you're not quite um, ninety degrees to the crossover by the time you you hit it. And it, there's enough of a, you know, a fraction of a second where it sees, you know, once one side sensor sees it a lot stronger than the other side sensor, and so it, it tries to turn to that direction. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other thing I would mention here is, um, and I think, um, I think I run my sensors much closer to the line than most people, um, uh, which because I always have, and that seems to work okay. Um, so certainly um, more difficult with the half size line board that we kind of ship out as the standard half size line board because that plugs into the into the socket on the UK Mars board, so that already gives it height, and then the sensors are looking down. Whereas I, I tend to like to have my sensors underneath the board, with quite little clearance, frankly, between the between the um, the sensors and the, and the surface. That's quite interesting. This is what separates out all the different entries, isn't it? Really, all these yeah. these things. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> yeah. Right. So it just means I'm bouncing the light off a very small point on the line because I'm very close and I'm using a narrow angle beam on the on the emitter. Um, so it's com coming off quite a, quite a well-defined point on the line. Um, I don't know whether that makes a difference. I, I, it's hard, hard to comment because I haven't 
I mean, you've got me worried now, but I haven't noticed any twitches going across crossovers. And if we looked at the repo, I'm sure we won't see any twitches when Magellan goes over there. Well, typically, typically is, sorry. Yeah, typically, the faster you go over the crossover, the less of a problem it is anyway. So the trick is <laughs> that, just to go true. faster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, it's exactly the same problem with the with seeing the edges on uh, in, in the maze, you know, where you tend to steer round into the corner uh, because you haven't decided that the walls disappeared yet. It's it's the same thing, isn't it? Same same problem. Yeah. I think with your single emitter sensor, Ian, you're always going to see a crossover as you being in the middle of the line. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. So the twitch is, you can still have a twitch, but it's going to be a lot less. Well, it, it basically, you think you're in the middle of the line, so you're going to yeah. drive straight. Yeah. Um, and that might, that might be the answer, doesn't it? Yeah. That might be the answer, yeah. 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 Thank you. So a question for Ian. Um, when you finish a run in both of your videos, uh, you give a very sexy twirl to one side yeah. or the other. Yes, yeah, so that's that about? Yeah. I fixed it now. <laughs> All right, okay. There was some. No, there was no. It's not good. It's not good um, because it's not predictable. It, 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 there was a. I introduced a bug when I put some code in. Funnily enough, I don't know how that happened. Um, and uh, it turns out I was just letting go as I could. As I, once I crossed the finish marker, I was just going. That's it. <laughs> don't worry about control. Um, it's a good lesson, actually, um, because I was I was doing the tuning for. Um, uh, Maze Runner 32, MR32, which I'm running on an old Decimus board. And you think you, you've got the hang of these things, right? And then you realise that you've forgotten something that you've known for years. So I was tuning up the turns to get a nice, crisp, 360-degree turn. And it just I kept going over, and I'd mess with this, and I'd change the radius of that and change the gain of the other. And then after about two hours of this, <laughs> embarrassingly, I remembered that what you actually have to do is not finish the turn and let go, but finish the turn, set the motors to zero, and wait a few hundred milliseconds, because otherwise inertia just keeps the damn thing yeah. turning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so what you get there is, from what you saw there, and I must admit, I saw it when I was doing the videos, and I thought, bloody hell, I must fix that. <laughs> so I found, found, found the bug and uh, uh, it now actually stops under control on the line rather than just going, oh, whatever you're doing, don't worry about it. <laughs> now, if you've got a big right-hand correction going on for some reason, you'll spin off that way and then you've got a left-hand correction, you'll spin off the other way. Um, so although it looks dramatic, it's not very impressive, really. Yeah. Well, at school, at school last week, we were um, having just got them to detect the end marker and stop. Um, I then said, okay, well, you need to actually go forwards a bit before they stop. Of course, so they just put a delay in, and of course, there's then been no control. And as they stopped, they were all over the place and exactly the same as that. So again, we had to then go back and say, okay, right, so while you're slowing down, <laughs> you've got yeah. to keep on steering. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I had actually got all that code in. I just hadn't got the motors. For some reason, the motor setting had been put onto the wrong clause of an if then else, and that was the end of that. <laughs> it just didn't do it. Um, but it's all, uh, I think it's sorted now. I have uh, an observation about the um, uh, making the uh, the record. Yeah, you know, right. Your log of your yeah. second and all that. Um, and again, I'd like um, Derek earlier. I speak as one who. Well, I have done a line follower, but I've not tried to con do a contest one. Um, there are two other measures of um, the turn that you might, you've almost certainly considered, but just, but they weren't mentioned. So uh, one is the average uh, steering error is a measure of curvature. Right? It'll, it'll waver around on a straight, but when you're going around a curve, there must be an offset of some description yeah, yeah. to generate the steering signal, right? So you can look yeah. at that. Yeah. Um, and the other is that, um, apart from the vagaries caused by the steering, the uh, a direct measure of the curvature of the turn, uh, which is a better measure than radius because there's no um, infinite division by zero, uh, is the 
the difference, the, the right minus the left divided by the right plus the left of the encoder counts, right? And that's a direct measure of the turn curvature. Is that, I have a drawing if anybody cares that much, but um, that's what it is. Yeah. Show us the drawing. Sorry, who was that? So you've got, I'm doing this backwards now. Um, so, Ian, Ian, can you yeah. just turn off the uh, sharing? Oh, so right. that, then we get a bigger picture of the... Just a sec. Oh, You're asking for a lot here, you know that, don't you? <laughs> oh, and we know that. <laughs> Uh, anybody who can who can get their slide full screen first go can't be having that much of a problem. Right, so um, presumably you can see that along with the reflection of yourselves on, on the shiny board. So you've got your mouse, that's the distance between the wheels, B. You're going around to turn, and this looks like a B, but is a Greek letter theta. Um, and so um, the angle of this turn is right minus left divided by your wheelbase. The distance that you've traveled is right plus left divided by two. One over the radius is the curvature, which is theta divided by the distance, which is twice right minus left over wheelbase right plus left. You can find this all over the place if you, if you look it up. But that, um, that should should give you an indication of the curvature if you want to calculate it, if you can rely upon your wheel encoders reasonably well. And certainly it should, I mean, like I say, I've not put this into a, a contest robot, but this is what you can do. Okay. People, people are taking notes. I'll leave it for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? That, well, I was just about to say, what Peter just said, uh, that's what I use to determine whether it's a curve or not, or, or rather, whether it's a straight or not, whether to increase speed. But I use the inverse because as it gets closer to being a straight, the difference being on the bottom means I get a very large increase in the number I get. So it's easier to determine, I find, whether it's uh, a straight or not. I just get a, an easier number to work with. But essentially, it, it, I guess there's no real difference. It just leaps out to my eyes when I see the numbers. It's the same calculation, except yeah. that it's if exactly. you use no, which are not radius, you don't get a singularity. So if they do go to zero, you don't get a division by zero. I've only ever seen the singularity once, and that was that's, last week. That's the only chance everybody gets. <laughs> that was last week. And then now I've put in an ex I'm testing for that singularity during the calculation. <laughs> So that was the end of learning the line. Uh, so I just thought I'd give a quick update. I did some measurements. Duncan posted me a wall and a couple of posts. Um, and uh, he'd done some rough measurements just to see that the, I think the visual light reflectivity was, was kind of reasonable. So I did a few measurements based on the um, uh, our infrared detector pair. And I'll just show you what I did, did there. Um, I was actually prototyping my um, sensor pairing for um, the half-size mouse, so I just used that, that breadboard setup. And I set out to measure um, the, the kind of response I got literally at 90 degrees to the wall, and then by placing the wall at 30 degrees to the emitters to give some idea of what kind of signal we'd see. Um, from uh, diagonal sensors on a, on a robot in the main. Um, I also, if you look at the walls that Duncan's printed, um, they've got clear structure in them. So there's, there's, there's supporting struts that go across, and the one I've got is one of the ones that's, pr that's been printed in two halves, so there's a join in the middle. So I thought I'd just check what kind of response we got from the uh, different parts of the wall as well. Uh, I also went to measure the posts, 
um, just so we could have a view of what that might look like. Um, and because I was using um, breadboard sensor pair, not the most stable um, fixing of a pair of sensors, um, I put a, a template together uh, on the basis that the breadboard would stay still while I'd move the wall uh, and try to avoid any um, silly ideas like that. And also, I did a quick comparison with some walls I've got, which I think are from Plymouth. So they're diff slightly different to the walls we've been using uh, either previously or, or currently, um, but they're all pretty much in the same kind of area, um, the old production walls. And I'll show you the results of that too. Um, so that was kind of the setup. You can see here, that's the sensor pair there, carefully secured in the breadboard. Um, and this is a template I locked up quickly so that I could line the breadboard up along these lines and then take the measurements by moving the wall along the different points, either at right angles or with the 30 degree angle on them. Um, now I'm going to stop sharing this and I'll share with you the spreadsheet um, which has got the results in it, I hope. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I could see what it was. Uh, so, can you guys see that um, yep. plot? Yep. Okay. So, this is actually, um, I'll just talk about what I had. I had an SFH 455 emitters. Uh, BPW85C photo transistor, um, a 33 ohm current limiting resistor on the on the emitter. Um, I think it was a 2K2 on the photo transistor, uh, and it was uh, current limited overall with a 47 ohm um, resistor charging it. 220 microfarad capacitor. Um, I was um, supplying the, the BPW85C, so the phototransistor, with 3.3 volts, um, but using an Arduino for the test. So we're never going to see uh, 1024, right? Because we've only got 3.3 volts going into a 5 volt uh, reference ABC. But this is the plot from um, uh, Duncan's printed wall from the middle of the wall uh, and pretty much what you kind of expect to see I think it's moving it away from 30 right right out to 190. Can you superimpose the um oh you, you are the wall on this I, wall am I ahead of myself you're ahead of, yeah no you just ahead of me don't you that's enough. Just hold on. So that's the center of the wall. Um, and then point, that this is the response from the void part. So you know your walls there, Duncan, you've got your supporting struts in the middle of them, where you've got less material, but the reflectivity is very, very much the same. Not, not a, this is at 90 degrees, this, this, this set of plots. Um, and also uh, I pointed it at the point where there's a strut um, and all the lines are superimposing on themselves. So that in terms of what's going on with looking at a wall um, straight on, um, it, it, it's it's almost indistinguishable as to which part of the wall you're looking at, which is great. That, that's all good stuff. Um, this is what a post looks like. Uh, I don't measure it quite as far out because by the time I get to a certain distance, the um, spot of the uh, emitter is actually going to spray on either side of the, of, of the post, so you're not going to get reading back from it. Um, but that's, that's again, for me, that's not a surprise to see that kind of difference between the post and the wall. 
um, and shouldn't be giving anybody any problems, frankly, uh, looking at it. Are you confident that the entire spot is on the wall, uh, is on the post, or bits falling off the edges? I'm, I'm confident because I put an infrared camera on it. Yeah, but you, that wouldn't necessarily see what's going on. It sees the spot on the. It sees the spot on the post. You actually see the spot on the post with the yeah. infrared camera. But when you, if you look invisible, right, you can see the spot. But reflections outside the visible spot still contribute to the number. Well, I was I, I was pretty pretty satisfied. I mean, if you look at the curve, I I haven't bothered trying to take it too far. Um, the performance is consistent there, even even when it's very close, when there's virtually no chance of missing the post. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. So that's that's those. Now this is actually um, that's a Plymouth wall. Um, so obviously I'm getting I'm getting more back off a of Plymouth wall than off off one of these, and I'm also actually at the top end here um, saturating the uh, the centre. Um, so saturation is going on up here. So there's more stuff coming back off the of Plymouth wall. Curves pretty much the same, and to be honest. The numbers aren't massively different. If you look at a Plymouth post, um, it's moved down by a lot more than the posts that you printed away from the wall and actually put it, <laughs> superimposed it perfectly on the wall, reflectivity uh, from the printed walls. So that, that's, that's what came back when we looked at the. Uh, um, the thing at right angles, and then down here, I don't know what I did down here. So I, I, I was, I haven't done this as extensive, but just wanted to sense check that. So the orange line is what you get back from a Plymouth when you're looking at it at 30 degrees, and the faint blue, gray, whatever it is line is what comes back off the printed wall um, again. Uh, so that that was kind of it for me. I, I, I and um, if I just stop that one, um, I, I've got a comment there. Does that just mean because the ones where you've got the big difference between the um, Plymouth wall and the um, resin wall was at ninety degrees? So are we just seeing that the Plymouth wall is shinier? It may well be. May well be. Um, it, it, it is visibly shinier. Um, I guess my only concern was to, to take a look at these and say what our friends is going to see. And um, I won't bother putting the slide up, but basically, as far as I can see, people should be able to cope with these walls perfectly happily on, on a robot. They're behaving very similarly. We're used to things having different levels uh, to be calibrated yeah. for, and I couldn't see. Uh, but actually, I was quite encouraged. They look, they look, that look good, and I like the fact that they reflect the same all the way along their length. That's, that's good. And that that um, that ties in with um, stuff I've done just to check those uh, those walls. They they are less reflective than uh, than the other ones than the uh, the, the current competition ones. Um, as long as that can fit in your calibration. What I know is on, on our maze, generally, we have all sorts of different, you know, painted walls, walls that aren't painted, um, and the mouse seems to go around absolutely fine. But as soon as you put one of those plastic ones in, it won't. You can calibrate them to the plastic ones, but they're far enough out to be, to be a problem if they're mixed with any other type. Um, so, so that's possibly an issue. But the thing about the, the resin walls is because we can make them ourselves, several of us can make them. Hmm? Yeah. Any time there's a shortage of them, we can just knock out some more. There's no reason for ever mixing 
than with um, yeah. with the wall. Yeah, and I think the the yeah that 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 should be the case. Um, but we've had that before where you get um, solid ones or ones that have been built with timer plates in that sort of thing. You know, timing gates where you've got a special wall that goes in, and uh, and suddenly that wall is is completely different, and it can completely. Uh, you know, throw you off to the point where you hit the wall or we hit the wall if it's not calibrated to it properly. So it might need mean that the timing gate ones need to be, you know, replaced with with those things. But the other alternative... No, I, no idea how long it took me to make... I know, I, I know it's a problem. I know. I, I agree. I'm just bringing it up as a... As, as a possibility. <laughs> um, but another possibility, of course, is just to put that... Um, that covering that you put on the wood ones on the uh, on the plastic ones. Yeah, but it's, that, that, that takes a while putting vinyl on all of them. Yeah, but it's still a it's still a case that it can be done by multiple people and all the rest of the advantages that you. But putting vinyl on the post isn't so easy. Uh, no, the posts are fine. The, I, I I wouldn't bother with the posts. Um, the, I, th- I think they're okay. They're always going to be different, and and I don't think that's a. Um, that's an issue. I mean, as far as I can see, Jack, what you're saying is if we mix them, there's a problem, and if we don't mix them, there isn't a problem. Yeah, yes, yeah. Um, um, they, you know, you've calibrated to one, and uh, and and that should be should be fine. Um, you just don't want that mixture of them. A notionally unmixed sets can be a problem. We so they can. Yeah, you know, you've got you've got two batches of of Korean plastic walls, and mm. some are yellow, and some not yeah. yellow, and but for the timing gates, you, you remind me of a, another problem. I don't know about the rest of you, but lately I'm getting real sick of break, mended, broken stuff. Metal yeah. went today. Hey, the, um, when we're ready to use a set of um, resin printed walls, I'm going to have to make a resin printed timing gate set to go with it because they will be very different. And that will yeah. be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, you could, you could, we could try that. And, and and if they if they are too low, you know, everybody has lots of problems. We can always still stick the the stuff on the top anyway. You know, well, that, no, much no, no, much. You have no idea how tedious it is to stick vinyl on those walls if you haven't done it. It's horrible. Um, the no, a better solution might be actually. No, we're going to need two different sets of timing gate walls. One for the the existing walls, for which they're not terribly different, and and, and I believe adequate. Yeah, uh, and we're going to need one to go with the resin walls, and an option <coughs> actually is to cover just the timing gates with a vinyl or other material, which cuts down the reflectivity to match the resin walls, right? Because that's that's just like three things that have to be done. Um, and they could, can they be turned upside down if I put them in the middle? No. Um, but even, that could even be temporary. You know, it might even be as simple as saying you could just kind of, Spray over it or crayon it or something and get the reflective. That would be the simple. I wonder solution. whether we could print some resin fascias to go on those timing gates. Mm. I, I suspect that the reason that they're lower is that they're transparent partly. You can look through them rather than, you know, so if you put a backing inside um, of the, the wall, it would probably be more reflective. Well, look, we don't I, need I, to worry about it this summer. No, so um, I try what, it. And I need to build some more timing gates anyway. So when I do, I will endeavour to design um, a resin printable timing gate to which I can simply screw in the components instead of yeah. slotting them up. Yeah. An okay, the, the, the resin printing of that for the timing gate is probably ideal because you're not you're not yeah. trying to hack out the middle. And of then, <laughs> and then, if I if I were to do more than one of those. We can take a set, cover them in vinyl, and they'll behave like the other ones to go in the other set of walls. If, if that's what we wanted to do, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, my, my take on it was they're perfectly good walls, and uh, we could, we could, you know, we were, we we're looking to complete our capability of the distributed maze, 
as far as I can see, those walls would be fine. That was my take on what yeah. I saw. I mean, in, in the end, um, uh, it's the, the competitor, you know, if they are less and they don't work quite well, it's the competitor's problem to, uh, you know, sort their sensors out. Yeah. Um, so that's that's fine. I'm, I'm just trying to point out that the differences and the things we might get the first time we try and use it. Okay. 